my pleasure to introduce one of my best friends, actually, and it's someone who I met just two years ago. Uh, I moved to New Hampshire, which is part of the reason we're here, by the way, uh, five years ago, and uh, my mother was going through cancer treatment, and she met someone that was actually cleaning her room, and she started talking about the fact that, oh, my son's involved with the Atlas Society. Are you familiar with Atlas Shrugged? Turned out the woman cleaning the room was familiar with it. She's involved with a group called the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. So she comes to me and she says, hey, the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance is having an annual dinner. Would you be willing to provide some Atlas Shrug DVDs? And would you be willing to come to the event? I said, sure. So I showed up and I'm sitting at the bar. I didn't know anyone. I'm, you know, I've been dealing with a lot of these family medical issues. And this guy comes up to me, this bearded gentleman comes up to me with two iPhones. One, you know, one of them has a cracked screen at the time, but he says, are you the Atlas Shrug guy? I said, yes. So he pulls out the phone, and he shows a picture of his wife wearing the, the Reardon bracelet. Well, from there, things have really taken a, a life of their own. George and his wife, Rhonda, put together the premiere of Atlas Shrug Part 2 in New Hampshire, where we had 170 attendees, including 100 elected officials, and then from there, now we have the conference here, and we had great turnout tonight. But I've known George as not only a, a great friend, but a serial entrepreneur and a real phenomenal activist. And I'm not going to go into all of the specific accomplishments. I'll let him do that, but I'll, I'll talk about just two. Uh, the New Hampshire State Legislature was the first legislature to legalize marijuana. And if I'm not mistaken, you are a co-sponsor of that piece of legislation. And New Hampshire is the first state to allow Tesla to sell automobiles directly and bypass the dealership model. Also, completely, uh, he was the driver of that and the sponsor of that piece of legislation as well. So without any more delay, I turn it over to George Lambert. Thank you. Oh, I'm going to get rid of this because it needs to be somewhere else. An interesting piece of information for you all. If this was a town meeting in New Hampshire, all of the people who aren't here lost their vote and yours got multiplied. You think I'm kidding. This is actually what we're talking about today. What we're talking about is what happens when you run for office. What happens when you engage in the process and what it means. My name is George Lambert, and about eight years ago, I was at my dad's funeral. And my dad had been an activist, and he was very proud of the fact that he stood up to the police in Manchester, New Hampshire in 1976 because they were abusive. He was a politician, he ran for office. He bought a box of business cards. He was a lousy politician. All he ever did is buy a box of business cards. <laughs> And he handed him out. He said, the police are abusive. And one day, he was watching the police in our great city beat someone up. And he told them to move along. And he said, no. And they said, what's your name? And he said, I have the right to remain silent. For which the police officer disagreed with a nightstick. And when he was done, they had beaten him. And they had put him in jail. I suspect kicking the officer in the privates was something that happened to advance the resisting arrest charge, but needless to say, everyone that day was a little unhappy. He got there. When you get arrested, you get one phone call. With his phone call, he called the chief of police. He said, my name is Reverend Lambert. You'll find my name on the ballot running for sheriff in Hillsborough County on a platform of police abuse and brutality. I'm presently in your jail. You have 10 minutes to get me out. And with that story, he made the front page of the paper and the police were going to be accountable for whether or not they could tell people, if you don't tell me your name, you're going to jail. Welcome to my America and why I fight for New Hampshire. At his funeral, I told that story. And my friends said, well, you know, you can complain about it all you want to, or you can put your name on a ballot and do something about it. And I said, really? 
And my neighbor said, yeah. And I said, well, you know what? The next time I have an opportunity, I'll do that. And with a big smile on his face, my neighbor said, that's tomorrow. <laughs> And I went in the next day. I put on a suit. I didn't know what I was doing. I put on a suit and a tie. I never do that. A dot-com guy. I had long hair and a tie. Um, and I f went in at 7.30 in the morning to fill out the little form and pay my $2 to run for office. I ran in an unopposed election, and I won. Unopposed. That was easy. I showed up for my first meeting. Nobody knew who I was. They were actually taking bets as to whether or not I'd actually show up because I never put out a sign. I never bought a business card. I never did a thing. And I showed up. And I was the new troll. Because after I got elected, as soon as I sat down, I said, hi, whose business are we doing here? Because I always thought it was the people's. <laughs> Guess what? The people who are elected don't actually think they need to do the people's job after they get elected. Unless somebody shows up and starts asking questions. Current reality of our political system is that if you show up, you get to set the tone in the dialogue. The government is a powerful servant and a fearful master. George Washington knew that. The founding of our nation, it was a problem and a concern. Didn't need to do anything about it. What I've learned is that power only responds to two things. That's fear and pain. For politicians, fear is not getting reelected, and pain is making sure they don't. I'm sorry to say, they don't know much else. People who engage in government do it for a number of reasons. Usually there's some benefit to them, something they care about or something that's important. Whatever it is they cherish. They will do whatever it takes, I'm sorry to say to accomplish their end goals and to have that power. The power is the ability to set policy, to appoint administrators who implement that policy, and to control the henchmen who actually enforce that policy. How's that sound for entertainment? So after I got elected, the first thing I did is I went to the police chief. You know, my family has a history with police chiefs, right? I walked in the police chief and I said, hello, officer, or Chief O'Brien. You don't know me, but I'm your new selectman. And he says, I met you once. Really? He says, yeah. He says, you came up to me and you told me that our police officers in their union were fundraising improperly. I said, that's right, I did. I said, hey, I'm going to call out anybody who's getting it wrong not because they agree with me, but because we should actually all honor a tradition and a code, which is accountability. That whole henchman thing. But we're gonna talk about the power for a second. How many of you know what it's like to actually have the power? How many of you would like the police officer who pulls you over to call you sir? How would you like his boss to call you, sir? Or ma'am. Or ma'am. <laughs> By the way, when you're married, I, yeah, when, when the video's off, you can ask. <clears throat> Actually, I will tell you that uh, I got stopped on my way in here the other day for driving with an unexpected, uninspected motor vehicle. I was pulling into the parking lot. I could show you the ticket. Anybody wants to see it? I got it. As this conference was starting, a police officer pulled me over, and he stopped me. And he wrote me a ticket. Yeah, they wrote my wife a ticket uh, for that uh, a couple months ago. And he said, the officer wrote me a ticket out here, says, well, we wrote you a ticket because we gave you a warning a month ago and you didn't do anything about it. I go, great, thank you very much. And the officer goes, I need to explain this to you. And I'm like, no, you don't. Do you know, really, I do. No, you don't. And, and I said, are you, are, am I under arrest? Because if not, you're done here. She looked at me going, who the hell are you? but I actually know how it works. See, what I need is I need to challenge that ticket to the Supreme Court of the state of New Hampshire because the legislature won't give up its addiction to federal money, so they won't repeal the law for car inspections. So we need a judge at the Supreme Court to invalidate it. I'm gonna do that, just so that you all know. If you can't get it done one way, you find a way. The power, 
The police officers think they have it. The elected officials think they have it. Everybody thinks they've got it. The people are the ones who should have it. What will elected officials actually do to keep their power? Oh, that's where I was going. It took me too long to get there. I apologize. It's funny because how many of you guys remember that Bill Clinton got in trouble at the White House for an intern? Some of you are old enough to remember that. Yep. Yeah. The person who was in charge, Speaker of the House, who was going out to push his impeachment was a guy named Newt Gingrich. How many of you remember that? How many of you find it interesting and ironic that Newt Gingrich's wife at the time was on television during the last presidential election going, while he was prosecuting Bill Clinton, he was living with his girlfriend in DC. How many of you find that interesting and ironic? <laughs> what is it about our culture that says you will do anything you can to keep the power? And who's gonna give up the ring? The reason I tell you that, and it's really important to hear, is I had a guy who some of you may have met, some of you haven't, who asked me, he said, we like what you're doing, you've been around for a while, you have a great deal of consistency. How do we know you won't be corrupted by the power? I told him, it's very simple, every man has his price. Every single man and woman has their price, and every one of them should know what it is. And we talked about that. And he said, are you sure you won't be corrupted? And I said, it's very, very simple. I have my price, I know what it is. It's a body bag, bring it anytime you want. <laughs> but I'm absolutely 100% committed to liberty, to making sure the government only does what it's supposed to do, and standing up to call out anyone who challenges that. And I can prove that with eight years worth of history. When you have somebody like that, they are dangerous to the entire system. Do you know why? That somebody who's going to be sort of standing up to corruption? Yeah. Because no one else has power over them. Ask my wife. Is that true, darling? What are they going to do? Kick me out of office? So what? I'll make more money. Uh, they did that too, but we'll, you know. Politicians don't want to lose their power. And none of them want to answer uncomfortable questions because when they do, they might risk the one thing that happens, and that is they won't get reelected. You're in my community. Is that right? Um, well, I represent your community for a number of years. Yes. Did I do what I'm saying I do out here? Absolutely. All the time? Was it pretty consistent? And when that happened, the game changed because I called the superintendent out at the school system on padding the budget. She said, for the first time in 40 years, I'm going to bring in a negative budget. And I said, but the taxpayers are all gonna pay more because you padded the numbers. And I called her out and I called her a liar in front of a group of people and she was mad. I went home and I wrote a letter to the editor that was two pages long. In our local newspaper, I wrote at 6 o'clock in the morning. I was steamed. Some of you who have met me will know that happens sometimes. I will get pissed. And I wrote this long rant, and I sent it in. And they called me in the morning, and they said, sorry, we, won't, we can't print this. And I said, why not? And they said, it's too long. I said, did you read it? And they go, no, it's too long. OK, OK. They read it. And they called me back, and they said, we'd like to run it over two weeks because it's too long, but we think we should print it. I'm like, OK. And they called me up and said, do you have a picture? We don't have a picture of you on file. I'm really sad to say the local paper, the Hudson Litchfield News, has a picture of me in a tie. I didn't even finish tying it because I was sleeping because I'd been up all night writing the article. They actually ran a full page explaining budgets, default budgets, and the vocabulary that's used by departments to increase taxation while telling you that they are costing you less money. <laughs> and they were. Pissed. Let me tell you, the next election was awesome for me because people in town had figured something out. And that is, I don't know anybody and nobody can bully me and I'm just going to say the way it is. Because when you have elected officials who answer tough questions and ask tough questions, the game changes. You see how it works? 
Is that interesting? Those who show up get to ask the questions if you're on this side of the table. And that's the magic. Activists show up, you put a room full of people in there, they ask questions, they complain, they do whatever you want, and the people behind the table say, thank you, we appreciate your questions, we're not going to answer them. There's a guy in New Hampshire who a couple months ago went out and said, you're going to give me answers. He left the building in handcuffs. In case you haven't seen the video, we can get it for you. I met with him a couple weeks ago. And the question asked by some friends of mine in the House is, why is it that citizens who are supposed to have the government accountable and answerable to them at all times are leaving the room in handcuffs when they demand answers? It goes back to the henchmen. So I'm going to tell you a little story. How many of you guys like a little fairy tale? I'm a big fan of something called The Wizard of Oz. How many of you guys like The Wizard of Oz? How many of you guys know that The Wizard of Oz is a story about politics, government, and money? A few of you. That's great. In the original version of The Wizard of Oz, the ruby slippers were not ruby, but silver slippers don't look that good on the big screen when you have only black and white. But let's talk about magical things that happen when you run for office because we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. When you show up, you end up in this new world. And in this new world, you get to go out and play. And you'll learn new things. The vocabulary will be different. There'll be people you don't know. But when you're there, the adventure continues, and it's all about the yellow brick road. It's all about the gold, and it's all about the money. The funny thing is that all the people who are spending it know they have an unlimited supply because they just have to say, we need it. And the customers are locked in. They don't have a choice as to whether or not to pay. Because ultimately, sooner or later, they'll show up with guns, and they will take your property. Taxation is theft. It's consensual theft. We sort of give it up. It's a racket. We say, you protect us. If you don't protect us, you'll take our stuff. The comparison between government and the mafia is impressive, because it is actually a protection racket. We know that, because that's what our Constitution says. It says that we all surrender up some of our natural rights for the protection of others. That's what it is. We're paying money to get something. In New Hampshire, Article 3 of the New Hampshire Constitution says we surrender up some of those natural rights for the protection of others, but without such equivalent, the surrender is void. And let me tell you, that's why I love living in New Hampshire, because nobody's figured out how to tell the government yet, I want the surrender is void part, but we're working on it. When you're in politics, you're going to meet new, some new friends. Everybody who wants something is going to be your friend. They're going to be looking for something. They might look for a brain. They might look for a heart. They might look for some courage. But they will always come with their hand out. You'll have new advisors. There will be people who want to have you do things. They will help you. They will give you all of the resources that you need to go and execute an agenda. Whose agenda? Well, it depends. But when you're the person in the seat, you get to engage in asking the questions and learning the agenda. And if nobody asks, it just passes by. Had you guys thought of this before? Is this a new worldview for you? When you, become a new, when you become a politician, you will have new enemies. How many of you guys think that you can get a new enemy when you join politics? Trust me, if you do it, they're coming, and they're awesome. My wife used to get frustrated because when we got, when I got elected, um, I told her, I said, you got to watch out because we're now under the microscope. And she said, that's probably not true. And she is one of those aggressive drivers. You guys have met those sometimes, you know, the kind that actually yells at someone or flips them off. I said, honey, because I have state legislative plates, you can't do that anymore. You just can't. I said, it will come back and it will bite you. And she goes, no, won't. And one day, she pulls out the local newspaper. And in it, we have a section called the Thumbs Up, Thumbs Down, every single week. And any citizen can go out and complain about anything they want to, and it gets put in the paper. And one week, it was talking about me and my driving. It was really her and her driving. They don't know the difference. All they saw was my legislative license plate. You have new enemies. I'm going to tell you how that this newspaper is a way for you to use the enemies and the friends to control the dialogue. 
But when you get in the game, they're going to throw things at you. The question is, will you care? I've developed a thicker skin, and I've realized that if I don't have enemies, I'm not working hard enough, I'm not actually getting anything done, and what was the point of showing up? I'm wasting my time. But I have figured out how to use my whole new set of powers. Because in reality, what most people who are engaged in the system from the voting booth don't know is the same thing that Dorothy didn't know in the beginning of Oz. And what was that? Do any of you remember? She could get home because, Dorothy, you always had the power. My job, our jobs, is to teach the public that it's their power, it's their money, and something else. How many of you have actually thought, I want to tell people about liberty, I want to advance the cause? I mean, you're here, right? You're all here because in some way you wish to participate in activism. But when you run for office, something different happens. My dad learned it accidentally, but he used it. And that was when you're running for office and something happens, they hand you the microphone. And the press covers you. And if they actually believe that you are a viable candidate, when you issue a press release, they show up. And they make your issues issues. And you get to control the dialogue. And when you control the dialogue, you change public opinion, and you get to educate. Now, people may not agree with you. They may agree with you. It doesn't really matter. Because we have this thing called a learning valence. Do you guys know what learning valences are? If I tell you that between here and my house, there are 12 stop signs, without you even thinking about it again, if you're riding with me, you're going to count them. Because you're going to try to validate whether or not I was right. And you don't even know this. It's subconscious. They're called learning valences. When I bring something to your attention, you start paying attention to it, and you check it. And if I can get those learning valences into your worldview by putting them in the newspaper, you will start becoming aware. And that awareness will change the debate, and it will impact what people notice, and it will actually bring out their confirmation bias. Have we all heard about a confirmation bias before? If you believe something, you will see all of the things that confirm it and go, yep, 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 that's real, or not. But there are so many things you could pay attention to. Why would you care? When we get to control the dialogue in the press and make people aware, we get to change the learning valence. We get to change their confirmation bias, and we get to change what they're paying attention to. We can educate them about the government having too much power. Free staters in New Hampshire, you've probably heard a little bit about them, have shown up and challenged the police for a long time. They record them. That's crazy. People shouldn't be able to record the police. You guys have all heard that, right? About a month ago, the president of the Free State Project wins a lawsuit, $59,000, against the town of Ware because she recorded the police and they arrested her and they charged her. She went to the board of selectmen in that town and she said, you know, I think this charge is too much, blah, 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 and asked the selectmen to do something about it. And you know what they said? They said, well, we'll just let the court see what they say. When she won the first lawsuit and the board of selectmen called her attorney and said, hi, you won a lawsuit, now you're suing us civilly. We need to talk about that, see if there's something we can do. Can we work something out? She said, Let's just see what the courts say. $59,000 later, she won $59,000. Standing up for a principle that is the police need to be accountable to the public at all times. And all of a sudden, maybe these, this crazy free stater lady who's in charge of all these other free stater people, maybe they're not so crazy. Maybe they're just saying, follow the law. And we're winning. You see it? Do you understand it? When, now, every time that the free stater types win a lawsuit, confirmation bias. Maybe the government's going too far. Maybe they're not so crazy. Ah, and the world changes. How am I doing for time? I've only, uh, I have a few more slides. Is, is any of this new to you guys? I'm not sure. I don't get a lot of reaction over here. How many people think we've learned something? Okay, we've got a few hands. That's pretty good. So I said to my friend Aaron Day, 
if you want to understand elections, you've got to be in one. <laughs> and I talked to him and that felt into engaging in an election um, in the spring. And I gave this same talk in the spring. And I said, you know what? When you show up and you put your name on the ballot, they give you the microphone. I didn't quite realize what that was going to mean. Matt Phillips and Aaron Day decide they're going to run for office. Matt runs for town council in Bedford, the community you're in right now. Uh, Aaron Day ran for school board. I got that a little wrong on the slide. The other side came out. They were well organized and they put out a mailer explaining that high ranking members of the Free State Project were here to destroy the community. God bless America. They worked hard to get the message out. Now let me ask you, we're in the town of Bedford in New Hampshire. How many people think that anyone outside of the border of Bedford will care about this story? Anybody think outside of Bedford someone will care? Raise your hand. Okay. How about outside of Bedford and the surrounding communities? How many people think that this is worthy of the New York Times? No? I got no's back here. Aaron, how long was your interview with a reporter from the New York Times? 45 minutes. They covered it. What? Crazy people talking about limiting government. Uh, how about running stories on the news almost every night in the two weeks before the election? Commentary above the fold, front page of the largest man, uh, newspaper in Manchester. Blog posts everywhere, covered by Ben Swan. All of this stuff. It was amazing. It actually was a story of national news. It came right out of this little community. Because these guys on the other side go out, they start throwing mud, and we start throwing mud back. And all of a sudden, the argument is about liberty, taxation, and money. And whether or not these people are trying to destroy the school system and the community. Because Aaron Day was asked, do you believe in public education? To which my good friend, and the reason we're good, such good friends is probably because of his response, he said, I believe that public education exists. <laughs> I sponsored legislation in the state of New Hampshire to actually repeal collective bargaining for all public employees. Because I believe that if you actually want a system that'll work, you need to pay people based on merit. I voted in New Hampshire a few weeks ago on a bill that prohibited the state from making it so that men can make, uh, be forced to make the same amount of money as women. Because I don't think the government should be telling my daughters they can't make more. Do you understand? Every single time, you go out and you build special classes. You encourage poor performance. The problem is that when the other side frames that, they frame it in such a way that we're oppressing people. We're not paying them enough or whatever. How many times have you seen a liberty argument in the press? Do you see that often? No. But when we get involved, when you get involved and you start engaging, all of a sudden we can make reasonable arguments. That make sense? These guys went out and they asked for money. They're really, really good at that, by the way. We need to ask for money whenever we're doing something. Go find the people who are interested and say, you know what? Do you care about this? Help us out. They do it. They lead with that. I know because a year ago when I was at this conference, I talked a little bit about running for governor. Um, I had, in the month before that, I was up trying to help raise money to get House members elected in New Hampshire, and people kept asking me about whether or not I was going to run for governor. <laughs> Are you kidding me? And people kept asking me, and so I finally sent an email to 10 friends. I said, people are asking me whether or not I should have, hold a fundraiser for, to run for governor. What do you think? And one of my friends goes out and posts that on a forum online. The Democrats ran a fundraiser against me. I'm not kidding. Bill O'Brien's lieutenant is running for governor. We need to raise money. The reporters start calling me 
And before I know it, I'm running for governor. And until I had a heart attack in October, I was the leading Republican candidate for governor in the state of New Hampshire. I'm just this crazy guy who wants liberty. But I was involved in the dialogue, and all of a sudden, when they actually started believing that we could raise money and that I was a viable candidate and that liberty could happen, the dialogue changed. Strange things have happened. Now, some of you might have actually seen my talk last year and remember that that was kind of funny, right? This guy, you know, doesn't know how to do the hair and the whole bit. Yeah, well, you know what? When they start ask, trying to raise money against you, you know you're being effective. The left is willing to intimidate. They're willing to use any resources at their disposal. They will do anything they can to power you, to pressure you, to embarrass you. And if they're not, you're not working hard enough. Aaron, in his little school board race, which wasn't very important, was accused of zoning violations in the community. They sent Channel 9 with a news truck to his house. You know, they do that for large explosions. They do that when buildings have burnt down, when 20 firefighters are dead. They roll a news truck. Or when Aaron Day runs for school board, they run a news truck. His wife was not happy. Whatever you do after the news truck, you probably don't want to show up unannounced. They put pressure on his family. There, there's, his, there's his wife, there's Aaron's wife. I think she's standing with uh, Rand Paul or something there. But uh, Yeah, all of a sudden, here you are. Everything you do could end up anywhere. When you show up, you get to engage in the dialogue. You get the microphone. You get to turn on the new learning valences. And you get to engage in elected activism. With that, thank you very much. I encourage you to come up to a microphone and ask a question and learn a little bit about how you can impact our future together. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? I haven't been elected to anything yet, but I don't know if you told Aaron that when I was running for state senate, one of the questions that the AFT, American Federation of Teachers, sent me, the last question was, are you a member of the Free State Project, one of their official questionnaires for candidates? Which I said, quite honestly, no, but I support what they do. I answered the same question, because uh, they sent it to all of us in New Hampshire. It's a new stock question for them. Um, and I said, no, but I would have been. They voted before I got here. And why is it that the American Federation of Teachers, which has tens of thousands of employees in the state, cares as to whether or not free staters are involved? There aren't that many of them. Why is that a question worthy of everyone in the state? Because they know what I just taught you. If you get elected, you get to do things. The Free State types in Grafton, New Hampshire, went out and repealed zoning. How many of you guys have heard of zoning before? Do your communities have zoning? They took over the zoning board and eliminated all zoning in the community. How's that for a win? Why not? If you're there, you get to decide. Sir. Um, you also sounded good across the curtain. I I'm just, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, very good. Um, I just wanted to mention, too, the importance in that um, my son, who uh, was an actor in New York, joined the Ron Paul campaign and, uh -huh. and ran the campaign in Maine that uh, uh, did so well. Excellent. And he's now running for state senate uh, there, and he's gotten the endorsement and funding from Ron Paul and a Rand Paul endorsement also. Wonderful. So it just shows how the Libertarian Party is pulling together. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the things he's most proud about is when uh, 10 delegates were stripped of their seats down in Florida so Ron Paul couldn't get the uh, uh, speech he was, he was denied. Eric was proud that he was the number one individual knocked off of all the Republican lists. Great. Because uh, he had done such a nice job up there. So, but he's taking your view. He's getting involved in politics in Maine, and he's, he's mm -hmm. running for a state Senate seat there. So, uh, and that's what happens. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. That's amazing. 
There's a picture of my daughter, uh, which I could show any of you who are interested. It's on my phone. Um, I'm going to say one more thing before I ask a question. I was a selectman in 2008 in New Hampshire. And one, uh, I had become somewhat political from behind the table. And the administrative assistant, Litchfield, said to me, so primaries tomorrow morning. You're out campaigning over the weekend? And I go, yes. He goes, out supporting Ron Paul? And I said, yes. He says, took your daughter? And I said, yes. He says, you haven't seen the union leader yet, have you? My daughter made the front page of the union leader in 2008 holding a Ron Paul sign. Ron Paul was not being allowed to participate in the debates in New Hampshire because he was not a viable candidate. The gentleman who changed the rules and made sure that Ron Paul's delegates could not be seated is a gentleman who's a former governor of the state of New Hampshire. His name is Sununu. And uh, he knows by now, of course, that outside of any of my roles here or anywhere else, my personal goal is to deflate the balloon windbag known as Sununu and destroy all of his power because he has taken the power away from the people. And I, personally, am guaranteeing him we're taking it back. For your son and for everyone else who voted for the friends of your son and who were told we don't get a seat at the table and can't engage in the debate because they don't want our message to be heard by the public because once it is, the public will have a new learning valence and they will start paying attention to issues like the Fed and sound money and limited government. Sir, you have a question. Hi, so I know you said you're a serial entrepreneur and I heard what you said about all the crap they put you through as uh, an elected official and all the, the countless amount of hours you have to put in for the possibility of a small victory in the legislature. So what's the personal benefit, motivation, when it, it just it seems like politics in general like what, 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 what should motivate us to like, I guess kind of throw our lives on the line uh, for like and possibly just ruin our reputation because people are misunderstanding us or misrepresenting us in the media or who, who, all the other things that could happen as an elected official. Like what's your, the personal benefit? Oh, um, you ever seen somebody's company destroyed? I'm asking. It's a it's a real question. Um, I, I've seen it. I've seen them damaged. So, I have a wife who you met. She hosts this conference. And one day, because the federal government made the business that um, I was in illegal, she lost four point seven million dollars because the government said, you can't do that. They took my children's um, benefit. And that's, you know, that's not an enormous amount of money. But you know what, it doesn't suck. That would have guaranteed every one of them goes to college anywhere they wanted to. It was just enough. But they destroyed my productive achievement by going out and saying, that a victimless crime was illegal. No American citizen could own a company that engaged in internet gambling. I wrote the first internet gambling bingo hall in the world. The country of Dominica, a little Caribbean country, wanted to actually engage in bingo. Very predictable, interesting game. We built the software. We had 1,000 players in 1996 playing for money in a bingo hall with a $100,000 game. Pay with your credit card, play the game, somebody wins money, blah, blah, blah. Perfectly legal, legitimate, and insured by Lloyds of London. A business model that worked. My company got acquired by a publicly traded company. They were going to go and promote this. They were going to go out and grow it. And the federal government goes out and makes the company illegal. 
How's that? Is that a good reason? You know what's the worst part? There were nine other guys who had it worse than I did. Those guys were told they were going to jail for engaging in business. One of them I met at a conference was to told me he was at a conference where he wasn't supposed to be because he was there illegally because it was in violation of what the judge had set for terms of his bail release. We chatted. He said, I'm specifically prohibited from engaging in potential business transactions with people who might, be, uh, who might have you know, things that would advance my business. And he said, you're in New Hampshire. He said, I need to know where you're not going to be at 4 o'clock on Thursday. Because I need to make sure I don't violate the judge's orders. Because I'm not supposed to run into you or do business with you in any way, shape, or form. And I said, there's a Barnes & Noble at exit 1 in Nashua. Whatever you do, don't be there at 4 o'clock on Thursday. Yeah. And then I almost sold them my company. Got it? When people go out and use the force of law to enforce victimless crime from people who are willing, who have the ability to willingly go out and engage in voluntary transactions, we have a problem. Now, most people who are engaged in the process, who are worried about their reputation, won't go out and make an argument for victimless crime. I did that. I sponsored the legislation in New Hampshire for decriminalization of victimless crime. And someone on the Criminal Justice Committee said to me, but what about prostitution? Let's have a difficult conversation. I'll have a conversation with you about the legalization of prostitution. A woman who is voluntarily engaged in prostitution, who is a victim of a crime, is unable to report an act of violence against her because she was engaged in criminal activity. That is not the protection guaranteed by our Constitution. If we have people willingly and voluntarily engaging in a transaction, whatever that is, that should be a negotiation between those people. The role of government under our Constitution is to protect life, liberty, and property. And we say in that Constitution, that's our job. In New Hampshire, Article 3 of the New Hampshire Constitution says we surrender up some of our natural rights for the protection of others. And without such equivalent, the surrender is void. Nowhere in there does it say, I need to be protected from myself. It says, I just need you to stop the bullies. We voluntarily engage with the mafia, we'll call the government, the protection racket, to be protected from others. And I'm not trying to be rude when I say that. I'm actually genuinely serious. It's a protection racket. That's what we all agreed to. That's why we pay taxes. We want to be protected from those who would like to invade us, who would like to assault us. And so we say, we'll give you some money so that you can make sure that no one can hurt us. But don't tell me what I can do with the rest of my property and resources. You're supposed to protect other people from violating my property rights. Does that make sense? Most people who've never actually gotten to the point where their life has been radically altered by the sword of the government, have enough passion to go out there and tell them, I've had enough. But I, my friends, have had enough, not for me, but for my children. My daughter showed up in fourth grade. She, you get to tour the state house in New Hampshire. My daughter showed up to tour the state house last year. She sat in a chair, and they told her about debating, and she debated over uh, what the state vegetable should be, mm -hmm. debate. And they teach the kids how it works in New Hampshire, because you have one representative for every 3,700 people. And she sat there, and she made an argument. And they had just explained to the kids how it works, and representatives might have to take questions. And I'm the only dad in the room. And I'm sitting in my own seat in the legislature, and I ask if I can ask a question. And she said, yes. She took my question. She stood up. 
And I stood up and I asked my question. And she came back after me better than a second term legislator. <laughs> She's in the fourth grade. In New Hampshire, you could be elected to the state house at 18 years old. You want to talk about the proud dad? Because guess what? She is going to change this nation and other kids like her because we're going to encourage them to stand up, to have a voice, and say no more. It stops here. A small number of people stood up and said that this colony shouldn't be ruled by the king. And they fought a battle that they could not win. If you look at the history books, what they wanted to do was impossible. We all see it now. As you look back, it was inevitable. Is that right? I dare you. Take a look at the history. There's some great stuff on it. And I'm telling you, I'm out there today to say liberty is inevitable. Because liberty started in Gutenberg's workshop. I can explain that. I, I'm running out of time. I can explain that in detail, but let me leave you with this one thought. America was formed with Gutenberg's press because as soon as you started to be able to mass produce and share information that allowed people to understand they no longer needed to be a slave, America was inevitable. America has been destroyed, okay, because we live in a country where when I was growing up, America was free and the Russians were the people who were oppressing their people. Now, Russian TV is freer than American TV today, okay? That's happened in my lifetime. Ask anyone around here who's older than me, they witnessed it. Russian TV has better reporting and so does Al Jazeera in terms of unbiased reporting. When you talk about freedom, America is not the model of freedom that it was 200 years ago or 100 years ago. And it's time for us to go out and say, you know what? I want free, I want transparent, and I want independence. The liberty we got in America has never really been, I own me. But that's the liberty worth having. And someone has to stand up for that voice. Now, I encourage you, if you actually think that has any value whatsoever, to go out and take it for yourself. Take it for your friends who don't understand. And you'll make a difference. I'm going to finish with, because uh, I'm, 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 I think I'm way over my time at this point. Is that right, Aaron? Oh, good. When I was, my wife and I went to Turkey uh, a couple years ago um, as ambassadors for the state of New Hampshire. And I learned a little bit about their culture. And they're interesting because they, if you watch them politically, they shift. Uh, and they're a very complicated culture. But they are a police state. They work very hard to tell you they're not a police state. But they're a police state, just like we are. There was a guy over there who was told that, among with some other, along with some others, he couldn't protest. They said, you can't hold a sign. You can't say anything. You can't do anything. You can't protest. So he showed up with his backpack in the park a little over a year ago, and he stood there. The police came up, and they asked him questions. He didn't say anything. They said, we want to search your backpack. He didn't answer them. They said, we want to check your pockets, and he ignored them. As they fished out everything in his pockets, they took off his backpack. He stood there. And people took pictures of it, they tweeted it, they put it on YouTube. And a couple of hours later, there were some other people standing there next to him. They didn't say anything, they didn't move, they didn't hold any signs, they didn't chant, they just stood there. And the more people who stood there, the more people who noticed they were standing there. And these protests replicated around Turkey. And they began to happen in every major city. You can go look this up, it's called the Standing Man. And when you see it, you'll realize that our job, when we understand this information, is to inspire other people to stand with us until everyone believes that liberty is inevitable. I hope that's an answer. 
i think that's it